whenever you are ready. Excellent. Okay, I'll go ahead and get us started. So hello and welcome to our virtual forum on open educational resources. We are so happy to have you join us today for a timely and engaging conversation. Today's panel discussion is co-hosted by the conference planning committees of the European Studies section and the Literatures in English, English section of the Association of College and Research Libraries. If you have not heard of either section before, please do visit the ESS and LES websites on ACRL and consider joining our memberships to support continued conversations in academic librarianship around the subjects you are interested in. You can find more information on the ACRL website at ala.org slash ACRL, and then you can search for either the European Studies section or Literatures in English section, or both, please. Um, I want to share a quick word of gratitude to all the members of both committees and to my wonderful collaborator, Ioannika Elliott of UNC Chapel Hill, uh, for working together to host this panel discussion. We are so pleased to be able to share this forum with you. Although our forum is hosted by two sections heavily focused in the humanities, this panel discussion will address a number of different perspectives and we encourage you to share your questions regardless of the scope. Before we get started, let me familiarize you with the format of our panel discussion. I will introduce our speakers who will each share their perspectives and work with you. Throughout the presentations, please feel free to share your questions over chat, although our speakers will formally address your questions at the end of the presentations. My co-host, Ioannika, and I will be monitoring the questions to share with the speakers. As a participant, your mic will remain muted throughout the presentation to cut down on background noise. Also, we will be recording this session for later viewing. So now, on to our speakers. Uh, it is my honor to introduce to you Jesse Ransom and Elena Sanchez Nogales to you today. Jesse Ransom currently works as the Teaching and Learning Product Specialist for Ex Libris, where she works with academic libraries throughout North America to understand how they support teaching and learning within their institutions and their goals for the future. She joined Ex Libris in early 2015 after 13 years spent working in libraries in various roles. She has an MLIS from the University of Washington and now lives in Denver, Colorado. For our session today, she'll provide an overview of OER, including the challenges and opportunities OER provides for libraries and their institutions. Elena Sanchez Nogales is a librarian. She joined the National Library of Spain in 2008. She is currently responsible for the library's web, intranet, and social media, as well as for all the projects associated with the global strategy for the use and reuse of data and digital content at her institution. It's a large job. This includes BE BNE Scholar, a project presented in this session and aimed at creating open educational resources from the library's collections while inspiring new uses for heritage digital content in teaching and learning. So thank you, Jesse and Elena, for joining us today. I will now turn the presentation over to Jesse, who will get us started. Okay, great. Let me just share my screen here and we'll get started. And let me know when you can see these slides. We can. Can you see them? Okay, perfect. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, hi everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, as Ava said, I'm the Teaching and Learning Product Specialist for Ex Libris. Um, if you're not already familiar with it, Ex Libris is a library software company, and I do work with a specific product that we have. But through this role, I work with libraries around what they're doing to support teaching and learning, to support course materials. Um, and as part of this, of course, I often hear about what they're doing to support OER. So I've talked to libraries that are all across the spectrum, some that are very heavily invested in OER, some that are very purposefully not working with OER, but most that are somewhere in between or are just starting just starting getting started with OER. I am sure that on this call today, we probably have a similar mix of people. So I'm going to be doing a brief introduction to OER, including some of the opportunities and challenges, as Ava said, but I'll also talk about some of the trends that are helping to push OER adoption forward. 
Um, I do want to start with a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, I learned about OER not as a student and not as a librarian and not as an educator. I learned about it because I wanted to understand what libraries were talking about when I was having these conversations with them. So my knowledge comes from the internet and it comes from following what people are doing and what schools are doing and from the conversations that I've had with libraries over the past several years. So um, I will be doing more of an overview based on what I see across the libraries that I work with, whereas Elena will present on more of a personal experience. Um, I think it's important to start by clarifying how I define open educational resources. I find that when I talk to people, sometimes people use uh, OER and learning affordability somewhat interchangeably or OER and open education somewhat interchangeably. So this is the definition that I use when I talk about OER. Um, for me personally, this is the most helpful way to think about the openness question of OER, which I think is the hardest piece to kind of define and wrap your head around. Um, so with OER, you have the right to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute the work. Um, and also, and in between all of those. So you have to be able to do all of those different things um, for something to fall within the context of OER. So when I talk about OER, you know, this is what I have in mind. Um, I think that these five R's provide a really great measure to understand you know, whether something really is open or not. Um, as you all know, there's a lot of resources that are free to use, for example, but not open in the sense of OER. So it is important to distinguish uh, the difference and to, to put that definition out there. Um, the themes of open education and OER really began in the early 2000s when there was a growing interest in MOOCs and in open courseware and also in open textbooks. So it's definitely not a new concept, but I think in the US this has really started to become much more commonly used and more commonly known in the past seven years or so. Um, it was hard for me to put an exact number on that, but as I was looking around at, you know, what different schools were doing and when they started doing it, um, I think around seven years was really where we started to see, um, you know, some, some real use of OER in the U.S. Uh, the slide that we're looking at right here, this is the Ithaca SNR 2018 faculty survey. Um, this is a longitudinal study that they do. They survey faculty every three years and they've done this since 2000 and they use a lot of the same questions year over year, but they change this as things change. And they asked about OER for the first time in 2018. And as part of this study, they found um, your faculty said approximately 32% of faculty said that they've used open textbooks, 24% that said that they've used open course modules, and 32% said that they've used open video lecture. Um, a lot fewer faculty say that they've created OER. I'm sure that this isn't a surprise to those of you who are working with OER, um, but 7% of faculty said that they had created open textbooks. Um, it was a little bit more for open course modules and, and video lectures, but um, significantly smaller than the number who are actually using um, OER. I think that these numbers are pretty significant. Um, there's obviously a long way to go, but 30% of faculty using open textbooks is definitely a significant number. Um, a number like that represents a lot of change in terms of how instructors or faculty are thinking about their course content and also thinking about the student experience. Um, so ultimately, I think it's safe to say that OER isn't going away anytime soon, but at the same time, with only 30% of faculty already using it, there's still a wide open landscape there. Um, I think it'll be really exciting to see what the next round of these numbers look like. Um, like I said, they do this survey every three years, so the next one will be 2021. Um, I think that there has, this is just based on my personal guess, not data, but I think that there's been probably a significant growth since 2018. And also that everything happening with COVID-19 is gonna really increase that adoption as well. I feel especially nerdy saying I'm excited about survey results, but I feel like I'm probably among friends here and I can say something like that. Um, so I'll be excited to see you know, what the next round of this looks like in terms of you know, how many faculty are, are working with OER. Um, going into a little bit more about the pros and cons of OER, um, or maybe it's better to say the opportunities and the challenges of OER, I think that you really do have to start with learning affordability because this represents such a huge benefit to students. Um, it's important to remember that this isn't the only benefit that OER provides, but also learning affordability and, and um, 
and you know that the cost of of textbooks for students is really going to be the most impactful piece of oer i think in a lot of ways um, learning affordability and oer like i said aren't the same thing but they are definitely tied together um, i think this is the piece that spoke to me uh, as well when i was first starting to learn about oer I read a study at one point a few years ago that said that 43% of students have skipped a meal to pay for course materials. And that's a really alarming number to hear. And there's a lot of uh, similar numbers like that. Um, those kinds of statistics just really aren't okay. So um, I'm gonna start by talking about OER and learning affordability because I, I, like I said, this is I think the most impactful benefit that OER can provide. Um, it's also the one that gets the most press. Uh, it's not difficult to understand why when you start to see some of the numbers that are coming out of some of the large and even not so large OER initiatives that are happening. Um, SUNY just announced that they're nearing $50 million worth of savings to students with their open courses. OpenStax estimates that they've saved students over $233 million just in this year alone. I originally read this as since 2012, and then I went back and read it and realized it said just this year. Um, so that's you know pretty significant in terms of what students would be paying for these resources. Um, this one is the OpenRN project that's funded by a $2.5 million grant from the Department of Education, and it's going to result in five new OER textbooks, um, and they estimate that this will save students $1.5 million annually. Um, these are just a few of the many, 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 many examples that are out there. I actually originally had more in this presentation, but I felt like no matter what I included, I would definitely be leaving people out. Um, I could probably use my whole time just sharing stories like this, but I think it's really compelling to see this type of thing. Um, and it doesn't have to be a big project to be able to make a big impact. Um, different store sources use different numbers for student savings, but they generally range between $30 and $130 per student per course. So if you think of a course with 50 students or 400 students or 1,000 students, it's not difficult to see how these numbers can really add up, especially year over year as the, the new resources are being used by more and more students. So definitely OER can have a huge impact in terms of learning affordability, but uh, OER isn't free. Uh, it's definitely free to use, but it isn't necessarily free to create. And I think that this is you know, obviously one of the big challenges with OER. Um, Achieving the Dreams OER degree initiative was a three-year project that involved 38 different community colleges across 13 states. And the report that's linked here is a really interesting look at the process, the outcomes, and the challenges of such a large program. Um, but they found that creating an OER degree pathway costed between uh, $300,000 and $1 million at the schools that shared their data as part of this program. Uh, and also that it averaged about $70 per student. But then as time goes on, that cost goes down because more and more students are able to use these resources. So it does it definitely become you know, more cost efficient the longer the program is in place, but many big OER projects or many OER projects in general do have a significant cost associated with them, um, especially those big ones that are getting a lot of publicity, and that's the cost of creating the materials. Um, you know, you can create something for free, but there's a lot of time involved and a lot of effort involved on the part of the authors who are working on these materials. And they're also, you know, even though we're talking about huge savings for students, those savings don't generally just fill up this bucket of new money for the institution. So it does have to come from somewhere if there are, you know, funded programs for creating OER, switching to OER. Um, of course, student enrollment, student success, and student retention does translate to additional funding for the school, and those are definitely tied to OER, or learning affordability projects, but you can see why OER adoption is as slow as it is. I always say if it was easy, everyone would do it, um, but you know, there are definitely some, some problems or some challenges associated with that. Uh, and I'm not trying to be the bearer of bad news here. I think it's a good thing to keep in mind, but it's also not the only option. You don't have to have millions of dollars to start working with OER. Programs like the ones that I've mentioned or many of the other ones that exist, which do have 
uh, an investment, a financial investment behind them result in materials that are free to use, which means that there is a growing repository of resources out there which are or will be free to use, edit, and share. So it's definitely worth following what's happening with these big federally funded um, or state funded projects or institutional funded pro projects. Um, it is also a lot of work to um, adopt an OER textbook, but it's definitely more work to write a new one from scratch. So, um, you know, as more and more of these, um, you know, big initiatives are happening, the things that you might be working on on your schools, at your schools, um, this will all just benefit everybody who's working with OER, uh, whether you have you know, funding in place for these things or not. Uh, and like I said, if you can replace even one textbook, that can have a huge impact for students and for the institution, especially in those high enrollment courses. And that impact will only grow year over year as more and more students are using those resources. Um, I feel like you can't have a presentation on OER without discussing learning affordability, but also it's not the only factor with OER. Um, there's a lot of additional benefits that OER uh, can provide. And I really like this quote here. I think that there's, when I think about OER, I always feel like there's something sort of morally right about OER. And I think that this quote really captures that quite nicely. So the most important reason for harnessing OER is that openly licensed educational materials have tremendous potential to contribute to improving the quality and effectiveness of education. And I think that's really the thing about OER. The potential for OER is gigantic. Um, it's about making high quality educational materials available uh, and accessible. And it's about relying on the power of collaboration and openness and sharing for the maintenance and the improvement of these resources moving forward. Um, it's quite a philosophical shift and that comes with, uh, like I said, a lot of potential benefits, but also a lot of concerns. Um, so let's look at the benefits first. Uh, in addition to learning affordability, um, student success and student retention really are also tied to learning affordability, but there's more to it to, than that. Um, OERs can help guarantee that every student has access to the course materials on day one, and this definitely matters uh, in terms of student success and student retention. There are now studies about the effectiveness of OER in the classroom, um, you know, and what it means for students to be able to access these resources right away. Originally, the studies that I was seeing were showing that students didn't do worse with OER, but now there are also some studies that are sh starting to show that they actually do better. Um, it matters that students have access to the learning materials. Uh, in addition, studies show that students don't buy the book before the course begins. Um, this isn't only because of the cost of the book and the financial burden related to that. It's also because they've taken classes where they don't use the textbook or they don't use big chunks of the textbook or some other student has said, oh, you don't need the book for that course. So a lot of students do wait to see if the textbook is actually going to be relevant. Um, I shouldn't say just textbook, all of the different resources that they may have to purchase for the course. They wait to see if they're relevant before, um, before they decide to, to get it one way or another. Uh, so, you know, that obviously will have an impact on you know, their ability to see, succeed in the course if they don't have the learning materials or all the learning mater materials for the course. Uh, and in addition, students can afford to take more courses when they don't have the extra textbook costs that are adding up across all of these different courses. Um, this was part of the Achieving the Dream report that I mentioned earlier they found that students were taking more courses when they had uh, OER. So again, this is all tied to learning affordability, but with the additional value of what it means to students and means to the institution. And then another big advantage of OER is academic freedom and academic quality. Um, I kind of lumped all of this into one category as sort of a catch-all for many of the other benefits that OER provides, which doesn't really do each of them justice. But there's often a concern that asking faculty to switch to OER takes away their academic freedom. I used to hear this a lot more. Um, I think as more faculty use OER, there are more stories about how in reality it does exactly the opposite. Um, they can remove content, they can add content to fit their course, so they don't have to worry about following the order of the textbook uh, to teach the content. Um, in addition, 
it matters to students when they're not required to read huge chunks of their textbook. They wonder why they bought it or why isn't that section relevant? Why are they skipping around in the textbook? With OER, the course materials are all applicable to the class and they're presented in the order that's appropriate for the way that it's being taught uh, by that specific uh, instructor. Um, also, the materials can be updated. Um, there was a conversation recently on the Lib OER listserv through Spark about how many marketing textbooks haven't been updated to include social media. Um, today, you wouldn't do marketing without social media. But with OER, you're not dependent on the publisher to add these kinds of pieces into the book, or you're not dependent on a three-year or five-year review cycle for updates that really should be or are more critical than that. Uh, OER also opens up new opportunities to support diversity and inclusion. Uh, student demographics, uh, especially in the US, are becoming more and more diverse every year. And with OER, faculty can trans translate things into a different language or they can use different spelling. I hear about using Canadian spelling, for example. Um, they can modify the content to meet different cultural needs. It can change the images that, they're, uh, that are in the textbook to reflect the students. Um, generally get rid of the dead white guys. <laughs> this is something that I hear actually quite a bit in the humanities field. Um, but faculty can do that type of thing and um, you know, really make the, the learning materials appropriate for the students who are going to be using them. Uh, and they can also provide an innovative experience for students. Um, you know, this is a new way to think about education, open pedagogy and getting rid of disposable assignments often go along with OER. And this is a really exciting way to think about education and what it, you know, what is the role of the student in education. And they can also think about collaboration in a different way, collaborating to create a new course or a new book, but also you know, collaborating with faculty who may have wrote a book five years ago. You know, I can still work on that and I can still be a part of that project. I can collaborate with students to create course materials. There's a lot of really exciting opportunities there. Um, I feel like all of my positive aspects come with a but here and I, w I didn't mean to do it that way, but um, these are all potential benefits of OER, but it does take intentional work to make to make that the case. And I really like this quote from Quill West quite a bit. Uh, OERs are not inherently diverse, nor are they necessarily inclusive. It's definitely possible for OER to include more diverse voices, but I suspect that intentional design is more important in creating inclusive learning than the licensing on the materials. And this this is really important to remember for all of the, the benefits that OER can provide. And I think that, you know, that's where I was saying there's so much potential. Um, OER isn't inherently more up to date. It just makes it possible for faculty to update the content. Um, so a lot of these benefits do also end up being challenges associated with OER. And I think that that's one of the uh, maybe hardest thing for me to wrap my head around is that there is so much potential, but it does require a lot of effort and a lot of trust in um, in human nature, I guess, in order to, to make this work. And that leads us to the challenges section. Um, there are definitely significant challenges surrounding OER, and I think it's, be, it's good to be aware of these potential hurdles as you might be looking at new or ongoing OER initiatives on your campus. Um, in addition to some of the things that I've already mentioned, um, I, I mentioned this already, but there is a significant time commitment to adopt OER, even if you're not replacing a textbook or if you're not, I'm sorry, writing a new textbook. Um, if you are, you know, finding something that already exists, there's time involved in reviewing that and adjusting the course to, to match the new textbook. Um, discoverability is, is an ongoing problem with OER. Uh, there is not one single repository for these resources. Um, I think that it's becoming even more broad as institutions are um, funding their own OER initiatives and hosting those, those resources locally. Um, so it's becoming harder and harder to, to find every piece of OER that exists. Uh, and in addition to that, they're sometimes lacking in, in quality metadata to, to really be able to find what you're looking for. Uh, coverage for different subjects is, um, is not uniform. Uh, many of the large OER projects that were funded over the past 10 years or so uh, really looked at high cost, high impact courses. So because of this, most of the OER that's available uh, is about 
um, is around general education courses where you can have a really big impact. This is definitely changing. It is definitely better than it was uh, even a few years ago as more institutions are starting to publish their own OER or um, you know, have their own institutional programs, grant programs for these resources, but it is definitely still a challenge. Um, licensing is also sometimes a sticky question. I think, um, you know, we think Creative Commons licensing is easy, but there's still a lot of questions about the images in a resource, you know, quotes in the resource, other text, um, other things that might be included in it. Uh, what do different licenses actually mean when you're starting to think about publishing your own intellectual property? You know, what does that mean for now and for the future? Um, you know, those are difficult questions. Um, the quality of the resources, again, there are very, very good resources out there and there's the advantage that you can fix them uh, in situations where you need to or update them, I should say, when you need to. Um, but at the same time, the challenge is that you may need to fix them. Um, there are definitely resources that aren't um, things that some faculty would, would choose to use in their courses. Uh, supplemental resources may not be available. Your textbooks often come with test questions, sample exams, homework platforms, even and other things like that. Uh, and switching to OER can sometimes mean giving up more than just the textbook. Um, this is also definitely changing as well. Um, as more and more courses are switched to OER, a lot of these resources do exist. So it's not a given, it's worth, it's worth taking a look here, but it is still a challenge when you're thinking about replacing a textbook. Um, and then the last one here is accessibility. This is really an opportunity and a challenge, but I put it here because I personally see um, it as you know, having the potential to be a bigger challenge. Uh, OER does open up the opportunity for things like um, different formats for resources, but also new resources must be intentionally designed with accessibility in mind and faculty may not be well versed in that. Um, overall, the good news is that a lot of these challenges are getting better and the more people that work with OER, the more resources there are to help with these types of things. And also, um, you know, there's a number of, of things that are happening right now that are really helping to push OER forward, which is ultimately just going to improve the, uh, the resources and the experience for, um, you know, more OER adoption moving forward. Um, so there is you know, definitely significant federal and state funding for OER now. Um, there are more studies about the positive learning outcomes to students that come with OER adoption. Uh, there are mandates for, for course markings, marking low or no cost courses at very institu various institutions, you know, both at the institutional and the state level. Um, trends toward zero cost degrees. We're also starting to see OER included as part of the tenure and promotion process. Um, the University of British Columbia announced a few years ago that they were including OER language in their tenure procedures. And also student advocacy is really growing. Uh, as more and more faculty use OER, more students become aware of it. And that can really have uh, a big impact in pushing this forward on, on campus. So there's definitely reason to be optimistic. And um, to tie it all back around, I wanna talk a little bit about the role of the library in all of this. Uh, we have made significant progress, but there's also a long way to go. And I think librarians really have um, the potential to make a really critical difference here. Uh, this graph is from the 2018-19 Connect OER report from Spark. And they found that 79% of institutions, uh, this was specifically in US and Canada, 79% um, of institutions that have OER positions have them housed in the library. Uh, there's a very natural fit between OER and libraries, and I think that this is really great to see. Um, there are only, uh, you know, if you look at all of the libraries that exist in higher ed, there's a long way to go here as well. Um, but the library really is a, a perfect match for OER. Um, a lot of the skills and the expertise of librarians is exactly matched to the challenges and the goals of OER. So things like searching for relevant content, um, descriptive metadata, evaluating resources for the quality of the resource, uh, understanding copyright. These are the types of things that librarians do all of the, all the time. Uh, but in addition to that, some of the core values of librarianship, such as information literacy and promoting lifelong learning and equitable access to information, this really does you know, match perfectly with the values of OER. 
And the reality is that higher education is cha changing or it has changed already to the point where we really need to think about the role of the library and how we define the library's support for course materials and for teaching and learning. Um, I talk to a lot of libraries who say, faculty don't want our help with their course materials. Um, you know, they don't, they don't want our opinion, they're the expert. But I think with OER, it really is different because it's hard. It's not something that's easy to do by yourself. Uh, there's a lot of challenges associated with it or confusing aspects for it. And it's a place where the library really can get involved and use this as an opportunity to um, you know, to define their support for teaching and learning and also prove the value that the library can provide to, um, to faculty and to these types of projects. Uh, I think OER will continue to have a huge impact in higher ed. I see this growing all the time and libraries really should be involved and should be leading these, pro these projects on their campus. Um, that's me kind of on my soapbox. So I appreciate uh, your time and I'll pass it over to Elena now. Oh, and thank you so much, Jesse. Please keep sharing your questions. We are collecting all of those and we'll try to collect as many of the, the links that people share as well. Okay, okay. Hello, everyone. Um, well, first, hello from Madrid, Spain, and thank you very much for inviting our library uh, to this forum and sharing our experiences. It's truly an honor. Um, let me share my screen. I'm starting. Is that okay? Excellent. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me start by introducing you to the National Library of Spain, Biblioteca Nacional de España. Here it is. Oh, it's not working. Sorry, the presentation is not working. Oh, here. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> this no is uh, okay. National Library of Spain, here it is. Uh, it's more than 300 years of uh, history. It's the oldest cultural institution in Spain and a collection of uh, more than 34 million documents and not only books, of course, knowledge in every existing format is preserved here. And our library, as, as so many other institutions, has gone through a process of steep digital transformation over the last 10 years or so that has deeply and rapidly transformed many aspects and processes from access and services to strategy and governance. Uh, within these very few years, uh, the library has created through digital and web environments, new forms of institutional cooperation, new narratives to tell and share heritage and experimented with more and more free tools and ways to support learning, um, uh, research, innovation. And very importantly, in that process, process, our institution soon understood the need of finding new, new approaches for collaborative creation, where citizens uh, might and should be engaged to bring new values to cultural heritage. Um, this path was very early set as an institutional priority, in fact, and it was made a strategic line in the 2015-2020 strategy plan, also following the legislation on the reuse of public information. And in 2016, uh, we managed to, launch, to define and launch a comprehensive program with the support of a public corporate entity under the Ministry of Energy, Tourism and the Digital Agenda here. And the program was built as BNE Lab as a framework covering different lines of action and projects, uh, all of them with the objective to promote the use and reuse of the library, library's data and digital resources. We have uh, since then been working on the library's uh, data sets to make them open and reusable. We have developed a, a crowdsourcing platform and many other projects uh, with different objectives oriented to specific professional areas, for example, gastronomy. And of course, Benescola, the project we'll be talking about today, um, our library has always uh, had inside programs with activities for students. And we have always been aware of the potential and the importance of giving visibility and presence to our heritage at schools 
of finding new, new values for our resources as a quality and primary source for education. Now with this digital program, we have the opportunity to make it digital and globally accessible through a full platform of services and resources for teachers and students. The idea of Benescolar, however, was not new. Uh, it, it arose a few years ago when the library was beginning to experiment with semantic technologies and linked link data. And back in 2015, we created a prototype uh, by enriching our digital descriptions with educational data and ontologies. Uh, a few thousand uh, of our digital records then allow teachers to search in this catalog by educational level or subject from the official curricula. So this was just a prototype, but the idea was extremely well received by teachers and definitely confirmed this as a path for the future. The new Penescolar, this is the new uh, project, is intended to be a full platform of resources, services, tools, and ideas for inspiration and recreation while also a community where teachers may share new proposals and resources. Um, it was presented in July last year and developed by a team of librarians from the National Library, educators and experts in technologies applied to education. Um, we, we created Benescolar for teachers and mainly for, for late primary and secondary edu education. Um, the different sections in the portal uh, you see show the variety of formats and resources we have been creating um, uh, for a, about two years and um, published so far. And all of them are based and use the library's data and digital collections. Um, a very important point here is that all these resources that we have created are intended to be examples of what can be done, what can be created with the library's content and inspiration uh, tools for teachers to create their own materials and sharing them. Uh, we want it to be only a starting point. And for that, we have prepared a wide variety of proposals using many different base materials, formats, tools, and methodologies. I will very quick, quickly go through them. Firstly, what we have called sequences. Uh, cover a subject from different angles for a project-based learning and collaborative participation from students. This is an example where we suggest traveling in time through advertising in our collection of historical newspapers. Each sequence offers a comprehensive approach to follow through different, through several sessions in the classroom or with the students. And normally the structure is always, firstly, an approach to the subject through a list of library resources and references for analysis and a set of proposed questions for debate and critical reflection uh, with students. Then a moment for production and this is where we encourage the creative recreation, the reuse and remix of the library's digital content. And here we always offer different options, uh, always supported by suggested tools, activities, methodologies, so they are highly adaptable. After that, there is always a moment for publishing, sharing, or presenting the results. And finally, a moment for evaluation of the activity by students and teachers. Again, providing all possible criteria and tools for that. This is all covered uh, in a full guide uh, for teachers that we offer. And we also give the, the material ready for the student to follow. And the activity may be also projected in the classroom through our digital tour or downloaded in SCORM format, a standard web, uh, for web-based educational resources. In this case, for example, we suggest an analysis of many different aspects that can be inferred from these old ads and the world where they, produce, they were produced, from, for example, gender stereotypes to beauty or entertainment, and always comparing them to advertising today in the student's experience. And here, for example, we suggest producing their own ads based on these old materials. But we have published many, many other activities along the sequences, and some of them are not, are not published yet, for example. But for example, we have sequences on historical political events as seen by the press, or uh, on cartoons, or on our Golden Age theater and the concept of destiny there, or on poetry and the carpe diem motif, on immigration and cultural diversity in Spain, 
or the big epidemics in history. And more, many more are coming. Um, here in these sequences, we, we propose, for example, uh, to produce a radio program, a school paper or debate, or designing a book cover. So there's a, a wide variety of options to support different approaches. Apart from the sequences, we have, uh, we also created videos using library resources. And again, on different subjects, all of them supported by methodological proposals for teachers. And this is a classic, uh, well-known format already, but still very successful. This is, for example, our video on the Spanish flu as seen in the papers of the time. When we published this, uh, of course, we could not anticipate how sadly interesting this would be uh, only a few months later. Um, but uh, very successful still, although it's very well known and used, this type of, form, of format. Here, what we call workshops offer a more practical, hands-on approach, but again, always using the library collections as a starting point. Here, we give a full path of discovery uh, of the library resources, uh, um, teach students how to look for them, how to discover them, uh, analyze them, and then uh, uh, suggest to create, for example, here, a true medieval illuminated manuscript and their students learn how to make their own paper or the technique of Gothic calligraphy or the art of illumination. But there are many different proposals, for example, uh, creating a collage uh, with images from our Civil War pictures or making a time machine with 3D glasses and again, images from our collections or making their own tools uh, as they were used by um, for sailing in the old times, for example, again, from our materials. And we have many more coming with next, within next weeks, for example, on cryptography, cooking techniques, engineering, or printing, but with loads of possibilities for teachers and students. And finally, finally what we call interactive challenges are more experimental and technology-based proposals, such as this digital escape room, uh, and also an app where teachers may uh, design geo-referenced and collaborative trivia games where students should also connect to the library digital resources in order to answer the questions. So these are, these are the formats we have created so far and we have tried to show as many as possible types of materials, interests for different edu educational levels, areas and subjects from the curriculum. However, in all of them, there are core ideas connected with the overall objectives of the, pro of the project and the program. All these materials try to, in some way, support information literacy and digital skills for a creative and innovative reuse of, of our primary resources and their transformation into other new products, and also skills to communicate and share the results. Also, they encourage a critical approach to memory, history, past and present, connecting past societies to the students' realities. And it's important also a uh, reflection on the importance of preserving our memory, just as national libraries do, uh, in order to understand our present and, and our future. Uh, they also try to inspire important, as we see, social values, such as respect for the difference, for the diversity, for minorities. And despite this being a digital ecosystem, there is always attention to the local, the nearby community. So therefore, we always suggest activities for that too. And still, there, there is more. Here, for example, it's uh, the search uh, feature um, because all the library documents used to create these resources, and many more, have been enriched using learning object metadata standards. And that is why they may, be, they may be searched here uh, with fil using filters such as educational level or subject. Uh, there are for the moment a few hundred records here, but teachers may catalog new documents themselves here or create their own collections. This is done in my Benescolar space, personal space, which is intended to be a growing repository of new resources and experiences created and shared by teachers. That's creating here also a community of Benescolar users. We are right now preparing a MOOC, uh, um, a course, a full course for teachers um, 
to guide them and help them with all the possibilities in Mena Escolar. And it will be published in an official a course platform for educators uh, by the Ministry of Education. We have a very close collaboration with the Ministry of Education. And we are working as well in many visual material for teachers reference and guide. And what are the results so far? Well, this is still a, a project under development. We are now in a second phase. We are adding new materials for more inspiration, more proposals. But so far, the project, we can say, has been very, very well received by teachers and education communities. And we have had already very positive experiences with teachers and students. Here, for example, um, impact, of course, has been remarkable during the lockdown period. Access to the platform has increased by 500 percent, more or less. And not only have teachers appreciated this as, a, as useful, but also families during these last months. And with all the new materials we are publishing in the coming weeks, we trust the community of users will significantly grow for next course. There is still much work ahead uh, to encourage teachers to actually make a full use of these resources with their students, and even more, to encourage them to create their own materials using all our documents and all our suggested tools and methodologies, which is actually the final goal of the project. That is the difficult, as Jesse mentioned, uh, but also the challenging and but the beautiful part of, of this project. Uh, when we see um, new creations, that is the most um, that is the most beautiful part of this. And, and we wanted to continue and we, we will put our effort in uh, on that. So we are just willing to learn so many more teaching and learning stories coming from this project and creating a, a true community around this initiative. I said before, the idea is that Venezuela is just the starting point, the inspiration that, that the sparkle that, that takes our cultural heritage to the classroom and to the students because heritage institutions have the quality, the credible, the trustworthy resources, the primary sources. And nowadays also they have the possibility and the mission to create these open democratic spaces for collaboration and for recreation of knowledge. And here we strongly believe our heritage institutions still have so much to say. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you both, Jesse and Alana. This is so great. I love having the, the broad focus and then a very specific focus. And we've, we've gotten some, some great feedback and some, some questions. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. We have a lot of questions. We'll try to get through them uh, as quickly as possible, uh, but we may run over a little bit. Is that all right for our speakers? Okay. We'll, we'll do our best. Um, uh, Yonica, I'm going to grab a couple of questions for Alana first, and then we can go into some of the, the, the first questions. So um, I did have a question uh, come in saying these materials are fantastic uh, for Alana. Uh, do you work directly with the schools or do teachers come to you individually? How do you create them? Yes, we, we have a network of, um, of schools that were especially interested in prototyping the project at the beginning, uh, suggesting new subjects, methodologies, uh, test our, our, the resources and so on. But now we want to expand it and make it, uh, let everyone, anyone come to us and suggest any, any other resource or any other activity. So. Uh, it's been a process from a, a small group for testing and for improving the initial, the, the phase one project uh, up to now, which we, we want to make it bigger and bigger. Excellent. Thank you for the question. We also have, uh, speaking of suggestions, we also have a suggestion. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the materials that you talked about were really great. And we had an attendee say they would love to see a sequence about colonization or migration or Hispanic diaspora. Do you have materials like that? Not for or, the moment, but, but okay. thank you for the suggestion. Thank you. And then I had one more question come in. Um, 
or a comment uh, saying uh, how great it is to have these resources. They're very good pedagogical resource uh, for college level Spanish language courses as well as instructors are always looking for that content. That's great. Yes. Yeah, we, we didn't we didn't think a lot about it, but it, but it's true that it's a it's Practice. another possibility for the for the project. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, and then we have a lot more questions kind of generally about OERs. I saw a lot of these coming in. Um, I also want to say if anyone on the call today has, you know, answers or has resources that you, you know, think are really helpful for the people on the call, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I think that we're all together in this so uh, if you found something that you know you think can help address some of these questions or um, you have experience that can help address some of these questions um, feel free to to also speak up it doesn't have to just be us um, Eva I will let you ask questions but I did want to clarify sure. something because I saw one of them in here oh um, sure that said have the studies that indicate students do worse with OERs been disproven um, I think I I'm wondering if this is because I talk really quickly. I know that I talk quickly. Um, what I meant to say is that the first studies about OER were saying that students didn't do worse. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that was sort of the bar is that they weren't doing worse in the course than they had been doing with the textbook. Uh, so there are definitely studies that are coming out, you know, studies originally said that, but there's more coming out now that are saying um, that they actually do better in in the courses than they they did um the uh one from the achieving the dream report uh mentioned that but there's there's other ones as well um so sorry to jump in but i did want to make sure that i clarified oh that. sure perfect that was uh that was one of the the ones on my list um i did have one from earlier on so i think there was a slide that you shared uh talking about the costs of creating oers and we had a question about how those costs were created were calculated is it mostly staff time or or what what is really behind the driving the the numbers up mm -hmm. Um, staff time, but also, you know, a lot of these uh, big OER projects do include stipends for faculty um, or, you know, grants or whatever it may be for faculty. So a way to compensate them for the time that they spend, you know, working on these. And, and that can definitely add up, um, you know, especially if you have a lot of, of new OER that you're creating or a lot of people who are working on something. So that's where the financial cost comes from, you know, for, for projects that have a financial cost associated with them, um, that would be you know, where those costs would be coming from. I think even with ones that don't have a financial cost, you know, where you're, you don't necessarily have a stipend for someone, there is still that time cost, you know, somebody uh -huh. is putting the time in, you know, whether they're paid for it or not, they're putting that time in. There's always a time cost. Mm -hmm. um, I had a comment come in saying that OER creation is mostly grant funded. How can we continue to support this over time once grants disappear? Um, at this person's institution, it involves a lot of professional development time for faculty for creating, using, adopting OER materials in their classes. Um, and that's a need that won't go away. So um, either mm -hmm. of you, please jump in and share your, your thoughts. Elena, feel free to jump in, but uh, I would say, you know, this is where you get to some of that, um, you know, the potential is huge and there's some challenges that come with that. Um, I think it's definitely, you know, we know from faculty who do this, it's much easier to keep using OER once you have switched, um, once you've made that switch. So the initial investment is big, but then the ongoing investment is much smaller. Um, Ideally, faculty are doing this anyway, um, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about their course, thinking about the materials, reviewing those materials to see if they need to make changes. Um, I don't have an answer for this question, though, and I don't know that there is an answer for this question. Yeah, that that seems that sounds very similar to to your experience, Elena, too, with like a huge um, investment initially, um, uh, and, and how are you feeling about continuing to, uh, to support that? Well, the idea, yeah, it's true that at the beginning, for me, the most complicated part is, part is what you said, the switch, the change in, ah. in this, this is something we should invest in. We, it's important for us to, uh, but, but it's true that at the beginning you need to invest uh, we we have to create the portal to 
create the the procedure, the methodology. But now we we hope that we encourage others to create uh, resources. We we will work on that. So uh, the investment is very little, just uh, a connecting point of us revising the materials, the quality of the resources. But uh, we trust, we hope, and the idea is that it's just a community of creators of resources. I love that, spawning more creators. Um, so the next question is, can the beneficial data for OERs be isolated by discipline or area or institution type? Uh, sciences are notorious for high textbook costs, and it would be helpful to see data on how the humanities relate to OER as well. So a couple of things involved in that. I don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised um, to find out that there are studies like this, especially looking at, you know, specific programs, specific courses that have switched to OER, but I can't point you to one. I'm sorry. Mm. If anyone okay. else can, please feel free to chime in, though. Yes, we are gathering as many of the, the URLs in the chat as well, so we'll be able to uh, clean this up and send that out as well. And then I have another comment, um, uh, and I think this is great for, for both of you because we're seeing kind of uh, uh, both of you and how you interact with OERs in the question. Uh, many university libraries also serve local communities. Is there any information on the use of OERs by local K through 12 schools? It definitely is. Yeah, it definitely sounds a lot like your uh, your project is definitely geared towards that local community. I really enjoyed that comment uh, that you said about making sure that there's a local uh, piece yeah. of the project as well. Yeah, because as I said, despite being a digital ecosystem uh, or based, uh, built on digital resources, um, we wanted to make it still local and encouraging uh, sharing, creating groups, um, for example, exhibiting the results in the at school or at the cultural centers uh, in 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 a town. So there is al always a proposal, like an activity. As a, there is still, in, it's still important this from the digital to maintain and encourage the relationship in the all those units. Um, that we cannot forget and they, they are so important in, in personal development and, and learning. That's our, our point of view. Yes, and we did have a couple of uh, URLs come in about libraries in K through 12 too. So we'll share those um, uh, in the FAQ document um, afterwards. So I did have a uh, comment about OERs counting towards tenure and promotion. Um, Jesse, have you heard anything about how that kind of translates or what people I'm are gonna experiencing? I'm going to share a link in the chat here um, for an article from Spark. This is several years old, but it has a couple of links that you can follow. Um, okay. This was, I think University of British Columbia was really the first school to start doing this. And there's um, actually an example of their, uh, or an excerpt of their, um, I'm looking at it right now, Guide to Reappointment, Promotion and Tenure Procedures. Uh, so I just put that link in the chat, in the chat for everybody. Excellent. Okay. Let's see. So I've got um, a couple more questions. Yes, I've got two more questions to be exact. Um, so with COVID-19, this is a comment from a participant. Um, this person has had uh, the director of the first year writing program ask about alternative textbooks since the ones that they were using previously weren't available in ebook format. Has anyone had experience successfully integrating OER resources into writing curriculum, not generating our own, but using other OERs that exist? This is another one I can't answer, but I can tell you the answer is definitely yes. Um, there are definitely people who are, are doing exactly this. And um, I will say if, uh, if anybody has you know, a specific experience, feel free to put that in the chat. I do have a link for a textbook. I'm going to, um, I'll have to search right. through my email, unfortunately, but I, I will put a link in the, the, the document uh, if people are interested. And then let's see. 
uh, the last one that I collected, but I'm going to just go through the chat again just to make sure. Um, it seems, okay, so I have two more. <laughs> Again, uh, it seems that some of the best moral arguments for OER are the same as open access publishing, yet many, if not most, faculty still publish in the major journal articles or with big presses if they can. For textbooks, I imagine they do it for financial reasons, uh, to pay for their own kids in college, for example. <laughs> no one gets out. <laughs> uh, the professors, uh, I'm sorry, the publishers also provide lots of institutional and editorial support. So how can they be incentivized both morally and financially. Mm -hmm. I talked about financial a little bit um, you know, through stipends or grant programs. I think the, the most powerful way uh, to communicate with faculty is really through students. Um, mm -hmm. You know, students being able to share the story of what does it mean when you you sign a three hundred dollar textbook for my course. You know, what does that mean for the students? I think that that again, you know, it is it is a big shift in the way that we think about education, and definitely in the way that that faculty you know think about uh, education or think about their work. But it is, I think probably the best way to go if you don't have the option to do the financial uh, incentives because that can be really powerful um, for faculty to hear more about you know the student perspective and and what their course is like from the student perspective um, I was going to say something else too but I forgot what it was so um, sorry about that that's that's great that's a that's a really excellent point um, let me see Okay, excellent. And then I have a couple of comments and some uh, some resources that have been shared, including one um, about how uh, how much people used uh, uh, Bene Scholar during the, the the total shutdown for Spain. Um, I've got a couple of links as well. Um, yes, and a couple of statements for for using textbooks. Okay, so uh, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to end us there, if that's all right. Uh, but I am checking the, the chat. I'm going to collect as much of the text as possible, and I'll, I'll put it together in a, a follow-up document that will go out with the recording as well. Excellent. Thank you for all right. the questions. Excellent. Yes. We Thank don't, you. We don't see you, but we, we feel you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, yes, excellent. So thank you so much for joining us for today's forum. Uh, we hope you feel empowered and inspired by our conversation. Uh, whether or not you are new to OERs, we hope this session will help you engage in new and exciting ways to support open access to information. Uh, thank you again, and we hope to see you at future ESS and LES um, uh, events and forums as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.